Air of Tov covering. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research and uh, fascinating teaching here. And we're just going to have to share this on Israeli News Live as well, because as the title says, Biblical Prophecy in the News, uh, it, it is a little bit old. Of course, the news is from July, but uh, when I share with you this amazing insight, uh, I think that you too will be blessed as much as it has blessed me. Uh, just, just being able to share this with you. And of course, I'm going into the story also the type of Yeshua with the type of David there. You guys have heard part of this story before, but there's some things that the Holy Spirit has revealed recently to me that I have never shared before, and I know you're going to really enjoy this. Uh, well, no doubt this will be airing on television as well. For those of you who be watching on uh, our broadcast there on Lassay Broadcasting, we certainly trust this is a blessing for you as well. Uh, let's get right into this broadcast here, Biblical Prophecy in the News there. Uh, and let's move on with this. Let's look at first, we're going to take a look here with UNESCO, recognized as Hebron, Tomb of the Patriarchs, as Palestinian heritage sites there. Israel and the U.S. waged intensive diplomatic efforts to thwart the Palestinian resolution. Israeli ministers of, uh, accused of UNESCO of denying history and being anti-Semitic. Now, I find this very fascinating because to me, clearly this is in biblical prophecy. And if there is any part of Israel that truly there is without question that this is the, uh, the Jewish homeland uh, and evidence that it is a Jewish homeland and should be the right to the, to the Jewish people, the, not just the Jewish, but the Israeli people, the people of the, the Hebraic descent people have a right to this place here. Because why? It's not just the tomb of the patriarch Abraham and Sarah, but this is also the tomb where Jacob and Leah are buried as well. And according to the Jewish belief, it is also where Adam and Eve are buried. Uh, you know, I can understand the Arabic world, uh, their love for this tomb as well, because truly Abraham is their father as well. They are our cousins. And so, yes, they should have a right to be able to come as well. It should not just be solely uh, for Jewish people only in that regards there because we do have the common father Abraham as our father uh, But when it comes to the fact that Jacob is buried there as well And Abraham would not allow this land to be given to him, but rather he purchased this land uh, as we saw in uh, 58 uh, Excuse me uh, 1958 that is where the Jewish people first began to return to Israel the modern-day state of Israel It was not formed as of yet but they begin to return into the Ottoman Empire and purchase the land that we see there in the Middle East today, both around Tel Aviv and around the Sea of uh, Galilee or the Kinneret, as we say it in the Hebrew language there, and bought large swaths of land there. We were coming back the same way that Abraham started, our forefather. Uh, but it clearly to me is a Jewish site predominantly because it is our, uh, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel is buried there as well as Leah. Now Rachel was not buried there. She's buried in another location because she did pass away and then uh, uh, Jacob did not actually bring, bring her body back there. So at any rate, that's the way I, I, I look at that there. And like I said, you know, it's nothing against the Arabic people because I believe they have a right to, to be able to come as well to this sacred site there because sharing the same father there. Let's move right along here, though, uh, going into 2 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to be looking at the story of David, and I think it'll be a blessing to you as well. Uh, 2 Samuel 15, 7, And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again, indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. Now, here's what's interesting. We already know the story here behind this. If you remember, you know, uh, Absalom was, of course, David's son. He had ended up in exile, though, down in Gesher, uh, in Syria because of the fact of killing his brother Amman, uh, uh, Abnon. And Amnon, uh, certainly we can understand why Absalom would become so angry because the fact that Amnon actually had raped Tamar 
Absalom's uh, sister. And he looked for an occasion to be able to kill, kill his brother uh, to get revenge for what he had done to his sister. And it's kind of a sad thing that the King David never did anything about it himself. But nonetheless, uh, when Absalom does kill him, then, of course, he has to flee because he is afraid of what his father would do to him. But when he returns, when he returns, you know, uh, comes back to Israel, uh, we know that there, you know, that's a big story about that. Uh, there was a little bit of a little wrangling there in order to get King David to allow him to come back. And once King David's, uh, his wrath was appeased over what had happened to his other son, Abnon, he had, he had mourned enough for him. Uh, then he does permit him to come back, but he's not willing to see Absalom regardless, though, at that time. Uh, but anyway, kind of going back into this whole issue about, though, the the um, the tomb itself, we can look at this particular article here. This is on Chabad.org, Cave of the Patriarchs, and it says here, one of the most famous pieces of real estate on the earth is the cave of, uh, as, as we say, Chama Machpila, which also known as the Cave of the Patriarchs in the southern Israeli city of Hebron. Now, Machpilah means doubled in Hebrew. One reason given is that for prestigious couples are buried there, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and of course, Jacob and Leah, as I mentioned already to you. I should have mentioned uh, Isaac and Rebekah from the beginning there. But anyway, I was trying to focus more with the fact of Jacob being he is the father of the 12 patriarchs. So clearly the grave site has been more so uh, with the implications of the Jewish people in mind. But this is not just the reason why I'm focusing on this. There's a lot to do with Hebron. We have to look at who actually is the one behind uh, Hebron coming under as a Palestinian site now, no longer being considered a Jewish site by UNESCO, but a Palestinian site. And that has a lot to do with the uh, Vatican pushing that in behind the scenes. Now, we're not going to necessarily find a direct link per se to the Vatican themselves, but it is what the driving factor is. And we're going to see inside of this particular story here, in, uh, in, in the story of Absalom there, you can find a very interesting insight that clearly seems to identify what happens after D David being a type, after David goes into exile, as he is a type of Christ. So it's a little bit complicated. I want to kind of clear this out. We're going to back up just a little bit here in the book of Samuel here. So let's move back up to verse 1 in chapter 15. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so. Now this is after Absalom comes back at the, at the, at the, at the uh, invitation of his father. Uh, he does come back. Joab makes that kind of happen there. Uh, like I said, through a little bit of a crafty way of doing it, but the king does have his son return, but he doesn't have him return to a place to where he is actually willing to see his face. Now keep that in mind. It's very important that he's not willing to see him at the time. But anyway, so Absalom rose up early, stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Oh, what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Hmm. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath in any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh unto him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to, to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You know, I find this very interesting. If you look at this in type form, you know, what is Absalom doing? Absalom is trying to become a mediator in this case here between the King, King David and the people themselves. It's kind of like David, if he were to be the place of Yeshua, Jesus that is. And as we already know from biblical scriptures there, there is no mediator between God and man except the man Christ Jesus. But let's just say in this case here, David being a type of God and Absalom is actually trying to become the mediator between 
God and man, so to speak here. But in this case, it's the king as a type there. Well, I found it interesting when we look back at this article here, Midi's trip, trip nears end, Pope navigates minefield of symbols. Jerusalem, Pope Francis has navigated to the uh, minefield of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and humbly bowed to kiss the hands of the Holocaust survivors on Monday, the last day of the Mideast trip, laden with bold personal gestures. Never again, Lord, never again, he said, in the dignity uh, uh, it hall of remembrance in the Yad Vashem Museum, which commemorates six million Jews killed by the Nazis in the world in World War II. Now, when I bring this up about Pope Francis, you have to understand Pope Francis is a type. He is a type of. He's also, and this is not just a type of Absalom, but you have to remember, a Jesuit pope is a Jew. And I don't know, I mean, maybe there is, but I don't know of another pope that actually would reach out and bow and kiss the, the hand of, uh, of the Jewish people, especially, except maybe that of Pope Francis. And so it not only is it historic, but it is also very interesting. And if you don't believe me, take a look at the image on the screen right here and remember what it says. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the heart of the men of Israel. So when I look at this as types and shadows, we're going to kind of go back and forward with this. It's not just to say everything is just one type or one shadow. But in this case here, it's very interesting because you have to re remember, as we look at the types and shadows here, the house of Israel has already been in, uh, you know, has been in exile for since, uh, I don't know, 780 BC, something like that before Yeshua ever came on the scene. And of course, at the time of David, though, they were not. They, the house of Israel and the house of Judah were still, it was one nation. The nation had not even been divided as of yet. But nonetheless, they do get divided later. We end up with two houses and one house goes into exile. The other house stays there until the coming of the Messiah. And then, of course, they, call, they go into exile after the rejection of Messiah. And this is what we're seeing in the story of, uh, of Absalom and King David. Absalom is his own son. I mean, Absalom means his name in Hebrew is Av Shalom. Now, I normally say my father is peace or father of peace. You could say it either way, uh, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the popes of Rome, they consider the, they call themselves father. And of course, they like to promote peace so that you could say they are father of peace in, in, in verbs or, in, or in, in words, but not in deeds, because truly Absalom, in his case also, his name meant father of peace, but was he a father of peace? No, he was a father of war. He went and tried to kill his own father, David. All right, but it gets very interesting. So it's not just a, it's not just a slant on Pope Francis here when I say this, because you're going to find out that there is still a love David has for Absalom, even though his son is an heir. And I would have to say the same thing. I don't agree with a lot of the things that the Vatican does or that with what Pope Francis does. But we have to remember in the error, because why? Like in the case of Israel, Israel is blinded that they cannot see. But God, would he longs for us to be able to see and to understand. And he's long suffering that not, that not any should not or none should perish. See, so we have to keep those type of things in mind. Now, let's let's move along right here because it's going to get much, much more interesting here. Second Samuel, chapter 15, verse 13. We're going to kind of jump down a little bit. And there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all the servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us sleep, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Now, you're going to be amazed by this. I'm telling you, you will. All right, let's look at this. David's men are like that of Jesus and his legion of angels. 
Looking at verse 15 again, And the king's servant servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Right? You remember Yeshua, what he did? You remember how he says in Matthew 26, 50, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? He's talking about Judas. <clears throat> then, they, th then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legion of angels? See, like David. See, David knew he had the mighty men that were with him. And he knew that if he needed to put down the rebel, uh, the, the, this, this rebellion that Absalom was doing, he could do it. But you see, he was trying to preserve life. Like the case of the story of Joseph. Joseph, now Joseph didn't know what was happening to him. His brother rise up against him, sell him out into slavery. Now he realizes in hindsight, after what happens with the king of Pharaoh, he rises up to the right hand of Pharaoh, etc. And then when his brethren come down, he reveals himself to him. He says, you know, don't be angry with yourselves. God did this to save life. And all these things were shadows. They were to show us the coming of the Mashiach. And for my Jewish brothers and sisters, don't you realize that these are signs for you? Now, you know, I had a precious friend right recently that said, Steve, you know, but you, you, you got to realize too, this is this not, this not just to the Jewish people, it's to the Gentiles as well. Sure, I know that, my brothers. Sure, I know that, my sisters. But the point is, is that God is trying to wake up Israel. See, Absalom is blind to who his own father is. He can't recognize that his father is anointed king over Israel, anointed by the prophet Samuel. In fact, that's where they went wrong. I need to tell that story. What I told that not long ago. I got to tell that again to you guys. So anyway, we move on. More parallels in the scripture. 2 Samuel 15, 16. And the king went forth and all of his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines to keep the house. Look at Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. What do you think? When David left, what did he do? He left behind ten concubines. Now, ten concubines, it's interesting that they're concubines. A concubine is a common law wife. She's not had her wedding ceremony. She's been taken as a bride, so to speak, but she's still, you know, yes, David lived with them, but there's still not, you know, there's not a formal marriage ceremony. And what did David do? He left them behind. Now, why would David do that? Again, it's types and shadows. He left them behind. He says, care for my house in my absence. When Yeshua left off the scene, he left a bride behind. And her charge is like that of David. Care for my house in my absence. See? And what is it? What is David's house? It's not David's house. In other words, Absalom, who is a type of his, two types. Absalom can type Rome itself. Like in the case of Hebron, notice, notice what he does. He goes to Hebron to declare that, he, that, that, that Absalom now reigneth. The Pope of Rome on 2014 during Passover takes and uh, takes a communion cup along with a male delegation, goes into the upper room there on Mount Zion, according to Obadiah's prophecy, drinks the wine and fulfills the prophe prophecy of Obadiah. But also, Hebron could not be left out. Why? There's a, there's a type in there. That's why we see that the United Nations, who has been, who is one of the main people for pushing for the, the establishment of the United Nations was the Vatican itself. And they are pushing also for the Palestinians to get control of Hebron. Why? Because Absalom must declare that he reigns. And what do we see? 
with the Pope of Rome. Just like the popes today, they consider themselves to be mediators between God and man. That's why we saw in the, in the case of, of, of Absalom, he goes down there and he stands at the gate and he sits there and he says, you know, he, 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 in, he got in between David and the people. See? He got in, got in the middle of that. Just like Timothy says. Timothy said there's only one mediator between God and man and that's the man Christ Jesus. We didn't need no mediator by, by Absalom. And that's what the Vatican has done. They believe you come to the priest, you confess your sins, and the priest will confess them to God for you. Absalom was doing the exact same thing. So in that regard, Absalom is a type, that, or the priest and the Pope of Rome and, and all of his priests are a type of Absalom in the regard of mediating between the king. The true king, Christ Jesus. Right? But in this case here, he also represents what? He represents the Jews of 2,000 years ago and even to this day that don't recognize that Yeshua was indeed the king of Israel. So it's twofold purpose in there. All right. So, so we look at the parallel here, and the king went forth and all his household after him, and the king left 10, ver 10, 10 women behind, the concubines there, right? And of course, that we have the ten virgins uh, uh, that speak of a Matthew where Jesus says, And they shall the kingdom of the heaven be likened to the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. See? David said, Care for my house. So as a believer, as believers in Yeshua, we are to care for our brothers, our Jewish brothers and sisters with love. Absalom took put a tent on top of the house and went in there and abused them. You know how many videos I've seen out there with, of, of Christian friends that are saying, you know, these Jews, they, they're no good, they're worthless. You know, you see they spit on the Christians, they do wrong to them. They're, that's the spirit of Absalom on them. They still claim that they're the father of peace like the popes of Rome claim that they're the father of peace. Both of them fighting for the same job. In reality, Pope Francis is a Jew. Sure he is. You can't be a Jesuit unless you're a Jew. That's part of the Jesuit. They, they believe that they've taken the priesthood, that they're following that lineage of it. So amazing the things that are just hidden in here everywhere. So let's continue on. 2 Samuel again, 15, chapter 15, starting with verse 23. We move on down a ways here. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself, after Absalom takes reign, David is on, on the run, right? And he's, gonna, he's going down, he's going to cross over the Kidron Valley, and he's going to go up and weep over Jerusalem, like G Jesus did the same thing, remember? But watch what he says here. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and the people passed over, and the king also himself passed over the brook of Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the, the way of, of the wilderness. And lo, Zadok also, and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abithar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring again and show me both it and his habitation." But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here I am I, let him do with me what seemeth good unto him. The king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Amahaz thy son, and Jonathan the son of Ebathar. And I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Wow. There is so much insight in what happens here. David is like Yeshua. Yeshua goes across. He crosses over the Kidron Valley. He goes up. He weeps over Jerusalem and says, "How uh, you know? Uh, how long I would have hovered you as a as a mother would her own brood, but you would not." David goes up barefooted. We're going to read that in just a minute, so I'll save on that. But notice this case with Zadok there. All right. Zadok the priest and Abi, uh, Abithar, both these men coming out as a type of Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses. See, and I say that, and notice, their sons were with them also, uh, uh, Ahamia, Ahamaz and Jonathan. 
And I find that fascinating that there they are, them and their sons. And of course, their sons only represent the coming of Moses and Elijah in the future time. Like Elijah with Elisha, and of course, Moses with Joshua ben Nun. All right? He says, And I will tarry in the plain in the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Now that's a type when Yeshua, Yeshua crosses the river of Jordan, in other words, death, because David does cross the river of Jordan after he goes up past the Kidron Valley, etc. And he crosses the river of Jordan, which is a type of the death of Yeshua, death, burial, and resurrection there. And he's where? In the presence of the Father, waiting for what? Waiting for the two witnesses to get them in one mind and one accord so that he can return. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful story here. Second Samuel 15, we're continuing on. And David went up to an ascent on the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up and had his head covered. And he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head. And they went up and weeping. And they went up. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray thee, Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. And unto, unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be burdened unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant here, hitherto, so will I now be thy servant, then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Hithophel. Now I find that fascinating. Watch what happens in this right here now. All right, now before we go there, I'm, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna back up just a minute. Like I said, David, at type of Yeshua, goes up and weeps over Jerusalem. Do you know this is one of the reasons why they believe that the Jews cover their head today with a kippah? Because David and his men went up on the mount and had their heads covered. Now, uh, there's a lot of different opinions about this, but I will say this. The Jews believe that in covering their heads with a kippah, and I used to wear one. You guys that watch the broadcast we've done here, Many years ago, we did, ex I, I always, as a Jewish believer, I always wore my kippah because I believed that this was in keeping to, to, the, to the, uh, the will of God. It wasn't a commandment of God because I knew good and well that God never commanded us to wear a kippah. And then one day when I saw this here, that David and his men covered their head, I realized, why has Israel got their head covered? They're in mourning of the Mashiach and don't even know it. It's a sign of mourning. And there's some rabbis that actually quote that very passage. Now, again, as you look, Jesus and David, a perfect type. I'm only going to read Matthew 23 here as to show, because we already read the other part in verse 30 of chapter 15 of 2 Samuel. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now here's what's fascinating. In some of the apocryphal writings, he actually says unto you say, Blessed are they that come in the name of the Lord. Now, I don't know if, there, if that was an implication of the two witnesses, but I take it from the King James here where he says, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You know, he himself being Yeshua. Because why? It's a type of David. But even if you took the they, what did David say? I will not come back until you certify me. And he said it to, to who? Zadok and uh, 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 Ibithar. The two priests that were also prophets. David said, art thou not a seer, a prophet? I mean, this is incredible to me, friends. And Yeshua clearly said, he's not going to return either until they say, blessed is he that, that, that comes in the name of the Lord. Now watch how this plays out. See, it plays out beautifully. Watch, we're jumping over to chapter 16 now. I'm going to go down to verse 5 and pick it up here, Second Samuel. And when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemai. Don't forget that. The son of Gerar, he came forth and cursed 
still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, come out, come out thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul in whose stead thou uh, hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said uh, Ibishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? So let him curse. Because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Ibishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone. Let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. Now, this Every bit of this is amazing to me when I think about Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew chapter 14, let's look at it. And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. This is after he's being brought up for judgment, right? The high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? You heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. You know, the thing is, is Shemai is a Benjamite. A lot of people don't realize that. He was, in fact, is a Benjamite. And the interesting thing, if you go back and we remember, again, we remember the story of Joseph. I taught this just the other day. Remember when we talk about how that Joseph took his cup when Benjamin comes down? His own brother from his own mother, and he's innocent. The boy has done nothing to his brother Joseph. He never was in the conspiracy of selling him out. I mean, at least Reuben was the righteous man trying to you know, save his brother's life, but they, they did it anyway. But he still becomes part of the conspiracy. But not Benjamin. And then Joseph takes and puts the cup in Benjamin's bag. And when he puts it in Benjamin's bag, they go back. And as they're headed on their way out, Joseph sends someone to overtake them. And of course, the cup is found in Benjamin's bag. And his brother's are like going nuts over there. Why did you do this? Why? Benjamin, for the tribe of Benjamin, he was innocent. And the Jews of today, our brothers today, might we could say we're innocent. We were no part of that. But yet God knew as a type that the Benjamites would reject Yeshua. And he would be rejected where? At the communion table with the cup in his hand. The same thing in the story of David. Who comes against David? The Benjamites. Who cries out for his blood? The Benjamites. Who cried out for Jesus' blood? The Benjamites. As well as, a, as well as the tribe of Judah. As well as the Levites. But the Levites told the Benjamites and the Judites, cry out, as for Barabbas, not Jesus. Let the murderer be released among us. And that, that spirit has been on us ever since. Why do you think that the Palestinians do so much that they do? It's just that spirit of Barabbas. See, a lot of evil that's going on, right? Now, let's just move on now. Going to 2 Samuel chapter 16, I mean, chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter 16, uh, 2 Samuel. Verse 20, then said Absalom to uh, Ahithophel, give counsel among you whatsoever we shall do. Now, what's happened now? David is already gone. And we know that Ahithophel, who used to be a counselor for David, and everyone considered his, his own words to be as if it was the word, it was the law. I think he translated it in, in, uh, in King James Verse, uh, uh, an oracle, like he was the great master but it doesn't say that. Actually, it's the word debad. Debad is the word. In other words, whatever he said, his word meant something. And it meant something to David. But now he has betrayed David like Judas betrayed Jesus. And you're going to see the perfect parallel in there. I never saw that before until just recently. He, he also does this to, to, to David. And now he's serving Absalom. 
And don't forget Hushai, David sends back to find out what's going on with his son Absalom. All right, so anyway, let's go back to it. Then said Absalom to uh, Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go into thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the, the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. And the counsel of Ahithophel which he counseled in those days was as if a man had inquired of the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Hittophel, both with David and with Absalom, as we mentioned already, right? So anyway, moving on, down to cha or over to chapter 17, starting with verse 1. So moreover, uh, after this happens, then Hittophel said unto Absalom, Let me know, choose out 12,000 men. And I will arise and pursue after David this night. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak handed and will make him afraid and all the people that are with him shall flee. Wow, keep, please keep that in mind. And I will smite the king only. And Hushai said, dropping down to verse 17, unto Absalom. Because see, now this, I'm only giving you part of the story right here, but just hold that. Ahithophel, what he says to Absalom, the counseling maids, he's betrayed, his, his, he's betrayed David, he was a loyal uh, servant to David, he's betrayed him, now he's calling for his blood, he says that his men are weak, they're going to flee, and then he's only going to kill the king. Sound familiar? Sound like what Judas did to Jesus after he betrayed him, after he betrayed him at the communion table, after he sold him out for 20 pieces of silver, and then what does David do? Takes down that army down there, right? We're going to get into that in just a moment. So it goes on to say, you drop down to verse 7, then Absalom turns to Hushai to get his thoughts on it. And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. So he's going to try to delay it. And then Hushai sends a message out to David to get out of the plains and get across the Jordan. All right. Also, interesting, the timelines even seem to match up with biblical prophecy. Then we drop down to verse 23 in the same chapter. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass, arose, and got him home to his house, to his city, and put his house in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Ahithophel is nothing but Judas all those thousands of years ago. Look at it. All right, now I have it in here on the screen in that little blue box here for you. Ahithophel said unto Absalom, let me now choose out 12,000 men, right? Okay. Matthew 24, 47, what does Judas do? And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staffs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Okay? But then he also, when you get down to verse 23, put his house in order and hanged himself. That's what Ahithophel did. What did Judas do? Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. By the way, putting your house in order is repentance. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned, and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. They said, What is it uh, that to us see thou to that? And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. Just like Ahithophel. Isn't it interesting? I mean, the type, my Jewish brother, sister, do you not see? We've been looking for Mashiach for 2,000 years. My, my fathers, just like yours, have come down. I have loved ones that died in the Holocaust, just like you did. I have a father from the Sephardic side, from Moroccan Jews that came up, as well as a mother from Ashkenazi side. So, I know exactly how you feel. And being the first one to believe in my family as a, as a believer in Yeshua. You know, now my mother visited churches. My dad, over the years, did a little bit as well. But I ended up leading my own mother to Christ. And my father as well. 2 Samuel chapter 18. 
We move on down now, getting to verse 5. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for, the, for, for, uh, for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. Now, as, as the story moves forward there, Absalom is going out to try, when he finds out where David is, he wants to go and, and rid David. He wants to kill him. Get rid of his, he wants to kill his own father. Amazing, isn't it? So he's going out there, but David is still his son. It's still his son, and David still cares about Absalom, even though his son doesn't recognize who he is. And Yeshua was the same way. That's why Yeshua wept over Jerusalem and said, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house will be left desolate. What does that mean? No Holy Spirit, no life in you. Until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And what was it with David? He says, I won't return until you get the people in one mind and one accord. Or until you call for me, I won't come. Speaking of the two, the two priests there, which is a representation of the two witnesses. Jeez. So the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave the captain's charge concerning Absalom. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and a mule went under the, under the thick. We drop down, by the way. I'm, not, I'm, I'm dropping down, just so you have to kind of pay attention. I went from verse 5 to verse 9. Absalom met the servants of David. And Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man and told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didn't thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said to Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son. God bless that man. For in our, in our hearing the king charged thee, and Ibishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. All right? Israel, though she's blinded, we're not to condemn her. Have mercy. That's David's desire. Even the churches, as messed up as they can get, do what you can. To help them. That's what the ten virgins are supposed to do. The concubines of David is to try to care for his house in his absence. And by the way, in David's day, all twelve tribes were there. So that includes the, the believers in Yeshua that are mixed up in doctrines. Don't sit there and try to kill them. Have a little compassion. Have a little mercy of their blindness and not recognizing they don't know who the true father is. My goodness. Let's move on. What David could not do, Christ did do, though. Watch what happens. We, we jump all the way over to chapter 18. Of course, what happens? Absalom is killed. Joab kills him. He drives three darts into his heart. And then the ten men that are with him, they all take turns stabbing their spears into him. Remember, you ever see the movie about David? They, they show that part there. Absalom being killed while he's hanging in the tree. Just brutally murdered. And friends, I hate to tell you this. This is what's happening today. This is what, you know, this is what the churches are doing to one another. It's what the, the Christians are doing to the Jews in Israel because they can't recognize Yeshua to be the Messiah. And, you know, I, I've been guilty to being hard on people sometimes. God forgive me. See, because I want to be more like that young man that did, wouldn't lay a hand on him, but would have mercy according to the desire of King David. And that's what Christ wants us to be, long-suffering and merciful, right? So this all goes on. This happens. And then the man that comes back to tell David that he was dead and thought this was a great reward made David so mad that he killed the guy for bringing the bad news. But then it comes down to this right here. David hears the news of his son's death. And watch how David reacts. Verse 33, And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And he went thus, he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, 
Would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. The son of David in the future did what David could not do. He did die for all of Israel. Mm. As we move on, David returns to Jerusalem. We get down to chapter 19, moving up. And of course, those of you that know, David begin to weep and mourn for Absalom like you wouldn't have it. And you know, even his own men begin to get angry with David and said, you know, you bring a shame for the men that fought and died for you. But you know, the thing is, what they did not realize is that Absalom was a type. He was a type of the future of Israel that would be blind and not recognize Yeshua to be the Mashiach. And this is why Absalom wept so much over his son. It was the same as Christ recognizing that Israel was going into 2,000 years and their house would be left desolate as if they were dead, spiritually speaking. That's why he wept the way he did. So the king arose after this all passes and sat in the gate and they told unto all the people saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate. And all the people came before the king for Israel had fled every man to his tent. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel like they are today. Saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines. And how has he fled out of the land for Absalom? And Absalom, whom he anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word, bringing the king back? And King David sent to Zadok and to Abithar the priests, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you last to bring the king back to his house, seeing the speech of all Israel is come to the king even to his house? You are my brethren, you are bone of my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are ye the last to bring the king, to bring back the king? I mean, this is beautiful to me. See, notice what he says, verse 9. We'll look at that again. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel. All the tribes. That's the ones in Israel today. They're in, in strife against Syria even when knowing that parts of the remnants of Ephraim are living in Damascus, the Christians that are there. And Manassas against Ephraim. And by the way, according to Dr. Pigeon, a good friend of mine, he says that the tribe of Manasseh, a little different than what some people believe, is actually many of those are living in Russia. They're Russian Jews. They're Russian Christians. Right? Don't even realize it. And then we have the other tribes, some in America, some in Europe, etc., all fighting one against the other. Wars and using their own weapons against one another. The churches are against one another. The different Orthodox sects are against one another. See, David said all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying the king saved us out of the hand of our enemies. And yes, Jesus died for us all, but yet we're all at war with one another. And he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines, the giants, the Nephilim. And now he has fled out of the land of, for Absalom because you didn't recognize him to be the Messiah, my Jewish brothers and sisters. Our forefathers didn't recognize him. He was killed and had to leave. Watch what it says. Well, let's move on, though. Going to verse 14, same chapter 19 of Samuel. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even the heart of, to, uh, of one man, this is, what, this is what they did. This is what Zadok did as a type of Moses and Elijah there, him and uh, uh, um, the, the priest there, Abithar. So that they sent this word unto the king, return thou and all thy servants. He had to get all of them in line. All twelve tribes, brother, sister. So the king returned and came to, jo to, to Jordan, the Jordan River. Christ crossed it. He's got to come back. And Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to conduct the king over the Jordan. And Shemai, the son of Gerir, a Benjamite, which was of Baharim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. 
And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons, and his twenty servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king, and there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household, and to do what? <laughs> wow, the ship of Zion, there it is. Thou thought good, and Shimei the son of Gerir fell down before the king as he was to come over Jordan, and said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. Friends, as we close here, I want to share with you why Shemai's name is used in this passage here in the book of Zechariah. Because what happened that day with David is the same type with Yeshua. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7, we begin, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. That's the house of Israel. That the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify, magnify themselves against Judah. Isn't that interesting? He's using David right there as a type. Why? Because you're going to see David is still a type of Christ. Even Zechariah the prophet saw it. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced or actually in the Hebrew that's thrust through. Now, most of us think of that being his hands and of course his feet. It could be his side though where he was thrust through with the spear by the Roman soldier. Yes, Israel still guilty of both charges. Because why? We delivered him to the Roman authorities to do the dirty work. That's the way it is. God clearly shows, even when it comes to uh, Titus, the Roman general, they say that it was the Syrian army that did the dirty work in destroying the temple. But God says you were as one of them, talking about Titus, the Roman general, when Jerusalem was destroyed, ransacked in 70 AD. So we are as one of them, even though we handed him over to the Romans. All right? So he goes on to say, You look upon him, me upon, excuse me, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. My friends, God showed me something about that today. It truly is going to be the house of Judah weeping over Yeshua that we killed him. But it also will be a reminder for Israel. Why? Because David wept over Absalom as if it was his only son. And the Israel did not understand. But in that day, they will understand. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. They're both from the tribe of Judah. The family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart. The family of Shemai apart, and their wives apart. Shemai, the Benjamite. Isn't it interesting that Zechariah brings him up? Why? Because Yeshua was thrust through. And when he's coming back, Shemai is going to be weeping as he was during the times of David and his family. All the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart, that's the Samaritans that were there as well. My friends, it is the most beautiful story, and I've not even done it justice. I pray God have mercy on me for not doing justice with this tonight. But it is an incredible story, an incredible, beautiful type to show us who the Mashiach really is. It is a message to the Jewish people as well as to the Christians of today. We must have mercy and forgiveness for one another. And recognize we have to be in one mind and one accord for the Mashiach 
for the Messiah, for Yeshua to return. And I can't see any other way but your two witnesses that will help bring them back. Bring the tribes of Israel, the believers of Yeshua, whether you be Jew or Gentile, into one mind and one accord, except for the type of Zadok and Abithar, your two witnesses. In this case, their sons are to be the ones that will be returning. That's the only way I can see that. And I know many think, well, we'll be gone before then. How are you going to go in a rapture when you can't agree with one another? You don't have enough love in your own heart for your brother to treat him as yourself. Think about it. We love you and thank you. Thank you for watching. By the way, I do want to mention uh, something very serious. Uh, uh, my wife needs your prayers. And I can't really say what this is about, but she is in very much need of prayer. And so we're asking you to be in prayer for her. Also, your support and help in this ministry is greatly appreciated. We do need your help as well. Uh, we do have to go back over to Europe here in November for a few weeks. We'll be coming back to the U.S. Then we go back to Europe again in the spring of the year as we'll be gone for quite a, quite a while then, but then we'll be back in the U.S. But we're hoping we return that we can actually, uh, if my wife gets to doing better, that we'll be able to start to come around and visit with you around the country here. We've been wanting to do that so much, but we are dealing with some very serious issues. Uh, and uh, I'm just not at liberty to speak about this, uh, but, uh, but my wife has asked me to say to you that she desperately needs your prayers. Very important. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, israelinewslive.org or .co.il. If you're in Israel, you can do israelinewslive.co.il. We thank you. God bless you. And we love you. Shalom.